Got a package full of wishes. A time machine, a magic wand. A glow made out of gold. No instructions or commandments. Laws of gravity and decisions to uphold. Printed on the box I see. Acme's built a world to be. Take a chance, grab a piece, help me to believe it. What kind of world do you want? Think anything. Let's start at the start. Build a masterpiece. Careful what you wish for. History starts now. Should there be people or peoples? Money, funny pedestals. Fools who never pay. Raise your arm and choose your steeple. And don't be shy, the satellites could look the other way. Lose the earthquakes, keep the fogs. Fill the oceans without the soul. Let every man on his own hand can you dig it baby what kind of world do you want think anything let's start at the start build a masterpiece careful what you wish for cause history starts now sunlight's on the bridge Sunlight's on the way Tomorrow's calling There's more to this than love What kind of world do you want? What kind of world do you want? What kind for what you wish for Start now Start now Good morning. Welcome to the University of Chicago. Thank you for being here with us today. I also want to thank our audiences online and at the university centers in Delhi, India, and Paris, France, who are joining us live via the webcast. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Sarah Nolan. I'm the Director of International Communications for the university, and I'll be your Master of Ceremonies today. Now please join me in welcoming the President of the University of Chicago, Robert J. Zimmer. Good morning, and welcome to the University of Chicago. I am pleased to see all of you here this morning, and that both so many visitors and so many members of our community have come to be part of today's event. We're deeply grateful to Richard Haas, the President of the Council on Foreign Relations, for joining us as our featured speaker to share his perspective on the need to better understand what is fueling 
a new era of violent conflicts around the world. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Haas. I want to thank our colleagues at the Harris School of Public Policy for their role in today's events, and especially the Dean of the Harris School, Daniel Deermeyer, for his dynamic leadership that has been essential to realizing a major initiative that I am about to announce. Please join me in recognizing Dean Deermeyer. Given that we have gathered here today to talk about conflicts around the world, it is my distinct pleasure to announce that the University of Chicago has received a transformative gift to create a landmark program to study and help resolve global conflicts. This transformative gift and the program it helps create will allow us to apply against this growing and seemingly intractable problem the rigorously analytic, evidence-based, and data-driven approach to inquiry for which the University of Chicago has been well known since its founding. The Thomas L. Pearson and the Pearson Family Members Foundation is donating to the University of Chicago $100 million, a gift equal in size to the second largest in the university's history to support the creation of the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts and the Pearson Global Forum, both to be at the Harris School of Public Policy. The Pearson Institute will focus on three main areas. Research to understand, pre prevent, and resolve violent conflicts through evidence-based and data-driven analysis of both past and existing conflicts. Engagement of the international policy and academic communities to advance evidence-based approaches and policies. Very importantly, the Pearson Institute will annually convene preeminent international policy leaders and scholars at the Pearson Global Forum to ensure the regular exchange of ideas and to maximize the potential for positive change by bringing together participants from a variety of sectors concerned with global conflicts. And education for the next generation of scholars and practitioners trained in evidence-based approaches to global conflicts. In each of these three ways, the Pearson Institute represents a fundamentally different approach to the variety of global conflicts that the world now confronts. Over many decades, the University of Chicago researchers have helped transform the social sciences through the creative use of quantitative tools. The Pearson Institute represents a critical new chapter in this work as our faculty and students will bring distinctive strengths to this vital field of study and policy. This remarkable gift and the creation of the Pearson Institute and the Pearson Global Forum signal a determined and unprecedented step in efforts to confront the new era of violent conflicts around the world. They reflect the deep concern that the Pearson family has for this set of problems and the extensive thought that they had put in to how best have an impact on the world. I want to express my great appreciation both personally and as president of the university to the Pearsons for this extraordinary gift, their motivations and commitment that lay behind it, and the confidence that they have demonstrated in the Harris School and the university. As part of the $100 million Pearson family gift, four named professorships will be established in the Harris School. The Reverend Dr. Richard L. Pearson, Professor of Global Conflict Studies, 
the Raymond Lee Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies, the Philip K. Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies, and the David L. Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies. The faculty director of the Pearson Institute will be a prominent scholar who will hold the first of these named chairs. Please join me in expressing our gratitude and heartfelt thanks of the University of Chicago community to members of the Pearson family. We will be hearing from two members of the Pearson family shortly about their passion for helping to make a difference on this critical issue. In addition to this announcement, we are honored to bring you an outstanding program today, one that offers an advanced look at the concerns that I know will drive eminent and influential work at the Pearson Institute for many years to come. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Thomas L. Pearson who along with his brother, Timothy Pearson, who will speak later in the program, has led the Pearson family's efforts to make the gift that we are announcing today. In addition to serving as chairman of the Thomas L. Pearson and Pearson Family Members Foundation, Thomas Pearson is a member of the Executive Council of Cohesive Capital Partners, a New York-based direct private equity firm. Previously, Mr. Pearson served 19 years as Senior Vice President for Law, Human Resources, and Administration, General Counsel and Secretary of Alliance Resource Partners and Alliance Holdings. Early in, earlier in his career, he was General Counsel and Secretary of McLeod Steel Products Corporation, Corporate Counsel of Midland Ross Corporation, and in private practice with the law firm of Ardor and Haddon. Mr. Pearson is active with numerous civic and charitable organizations. In 2012 and 2013, he was the first global benefactor of the Nobel Peace Prize concert and the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo, Norway, through the Thomas L. Pearson and the Pearson Family Members Fund. He's a graduate of DePaul University, where he received a bachelor's degree in history and communication, summa cum laude as well as a graduate with honors of the University of Iowa's College of Law. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Thomas L. Pearson. Thank you, President Zimmer. I appreciate your kind words. On behalf of myself, my brothers, Tim, Phil, who unfortunately was not able to be with us today, and David, as well as my wife, Jacqueline, and other members of the extended Pearson family, we're honored to participate in today's global announcement concerning the creation of the Pearson Institute for the study and resolution of global conflicts and the formation of the Pearson Global Forum. Before I proceed further, however, I would like to acknowledge John Androsik for his moving performance of World, if you'd join me. John, clearly music can capture and express that which cannot be said and on which it is impossible to be silent. The Pearson family is honored to partner with the University of Chicago and the Harris School for Public Policy in these groundbreaking undertakings. Our gift is intended to advance the scholarship, understanding, and resolution of global conflicts, and in doing so, 
to place the Pearson Institute and the Pearson Global Forum at the forefront of public policy deliberations and discussions and the design of policy solutions. Under the auspices of the University of Chicago President, Robert J. Zimmer, and the Dean of the Harris School of Public Policy, Daniel Deermeyer, we are absolutely convinced that the Pearson Institute and the Pearson Global Forum will become global voices and leaders in understanding violent conflict and contributing to its prevention and resolution. The Pearson family brought, the, brought this initiative to the University of Chicago because of the university's reputation and history where rigorous inquiry is applied to the world's toughest problems. The Pearson family, as noted by President Zimmer, has a longstanding interest in the resolution of global disputes and conflicts. As the past global benefactor of the Nobel Peace Prize concert and the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo, we do have a family legacy of involvement with leaders in this field. We believe today there is no more single issue that is more important than the study of the intersection of war, failed states, terrorism, and economic cataclysms. And more importantly, the response that the design of policies directed toward forming a more peaceful world will have. As to the critical need for the Pearson Institute and the Pearson Global Forum, the facts speak for themselves. Today, as we all know, there's a global refugee and migration crisis. 19.5 million people are refugees worldwide. The UN estimates that more people have been displaced this year than any time since World War II. In total, one out of every 122 people, a total of 59.5 million, is either a refugee internally displaced or seeking asylum. To put this in even better context, if this were the population of a country, one country, it would be the 24th largest in the world. In the case of Syria, war has displaced one out of every two Syrians. With 6.5 million displaced within Syria and over 4.1 million refugees abroad. Tragically, the impact on children is even more staggering. Over 51% of the refugee population in 2014 was children under the age of 18. Our charitable gift, a family investment if you will, in the Pearson Institute and the Pearson Global Forum is undertaken with the purpose of employing the analytically rigorous, data-driven approach pioneered by the University of Chicago and a global perspective to understanding violent conflict. The joint mission of the Pearson Institute and the Pearson Global Forum is relatively straightforward, to contribute to the advancement of a global society at peace, including, first, using the Pearson Global Forum to convene annually leading scholars and policymakers from around the world. The forum's goals are to ensure the regular exchange of ideas, to maximize the potential for impact in preventing and resolving violent conflicts, and to inform public policy. Second, to promote the application of the Pearson Institute's research findings within the academic community and for the benefit of the general public. And third, as importantly, to engage students, scholars, and policymakers through educational programs and academic courses with respect to issues related to global, global conflict resolution. In addition to an expansive curriculum focused on global conflict resolution to be developed by the university, our gift also encompasses establishing four teaching faculty chairs and named professorships, creating the Pearson Fellows Program for Masters of Public Policy students, and creating the Pearson Scholars Program for PhD students. Before I close, I would be remiss in 
not thanking several people and advisors and counselors who provided critical input to Tim and I throughout this process. Steven Snitzer, Jeffrey Burns, Daniel Shapiro, Neil Kawashima, and George Ledwith. Tim and I thank you. As I shared a few minutes ago, the Pearson family believes that the time to act is now. There is no more important challenge of our time. Waiting is not an option. We have faith in the University of Chicago and the Harris School for Public Policy's ability to steward our gift, and in doing so, to make a significant, a real, and a lasting contribution to the world and to humankind. We can think of no more important legacy for our family. So I thank you. Thank you. in a world where we face a whole variety of new conflicts that we just haven't seen in earlier times. The idea that we're going to defeat groups like the Islamic State or indeed the Taliban with standard uh, military techniques is for the birds. Think about what's happening in the world today. No other time since the end of World War II have we seen as many refugees and internally displaced persons than we do today. Of course, more important than just keeping people alive and keeping them fed is actually resolving the crises so that they can go home again. We're launching the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts with a $100 million gift with the goal of creating the place where leading academics and policymakers can come together to create new innovative solutions to the resolution of global conflicts. The reality is that what we're now dealing with is uh, a fantastically complex web of public policy, of military, and indeed of economic challenges. When I was told about the uh, establishment of the Pearson Institute, I was particularly interested because of the legacy of economic work that the University of Chicago has got. There has always been a commitment to thinking carefully according to rigorous analytical methodology, thinking carefully about social science problems. We're bringing together quantitative, rigorous, data-based approaches that have been successful in so many other policy areas to the area of global conflicts. The timing of this endeavor is so key. The prescriptions are underexplored, and the international community is looking for better ways to act together to address these problems. Quantitative data is essential for conducting good evidence-based policy. The fact that the Institute wants to make it a priority can really have a big impact. Everything that we do is focused on evidence-based and results-driven. It's the only way we can evaluate whether or not we are reaching the outcomes we want to see. Now is the time for the Pearson Institute. We have tremendous humanitarian costs. We have a new generation of scholars that use data, that use experiments, that use modeling at a level of sophistication that we just haven't seen even 10 or 15 years ago. Having conversations with academics can be extremely productive and extremely effective in seeking practical solutions. When I first heard about plans for the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts, I was thrilled. The people themselves were caught up in these crises. They don't have the luxury of sitting and reflecting on what needs to be done to solve this. We need the best minds. The dilemmas of policymaking, the unraveling of the states in Iraq and Syria, you are seeing policy questions that demand the most careful thought, and it's going to happen here at the Pearson Institute. With this investment from the Pearson family, 
We really have the opportunity here to have a dramatic policy impact in the greatest foreign policy challenge of our time. Please welcome Dean of the Harris School of Public Policy and Emmett Dedman Professor of Public Administration, Daniel Deermeyer. Thank you. It is rare that one has an opportunity to really make a difference. But today is one of these days. I'm extremely grateful to the Pearson family for placing their trust in the Harris School and the University of Chicago to tackle the most important foreign policy challenge of our time. I also want to express my gratitude to President Zimmer and the Board of Trustees for supporting us in making our vision a reality. And I'm particularly thankful for the team that has worked so diligently over months to make today possible. It has been an honor and a pleasure to work with you on this great task. What a day. When I resumed my role as dean a year and four weeks ago, I'm still keeping track, uh, I was struck by the University of Chicago's culture of rigorous inquiry, its intellectual fearlessness, and its potential for addressing the world's greatest policy challenges. Today, in this moment, I believe this more than ever. Today, thanks to the generosity of the Pearson family, we have the potential to do something incredibly powerful to transform how we think about conflict, to tear down the barriers that often exist between the academy and the policy community, and to have tremendous impact on the lives of literally millions of people around the world. This is why we're here today. This is why I believe so deeply in the mission of the Pearson Institute and the important work we're about to undertake at the Harris School. The creation of the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts comes at a critical moment for the world. Never has the need been greater to rethink the approach to preventing and resolving global conflicts. From the train stations in Europe to the ruined streets of Sanaa and the other countless on-screen images we've seen in Mandel Hall today, it is easy to despair over the worsening humanitarian, economic, and cultural crises reverberating through the world. But through the power of rigorous inquiry, I know we will help to bring about change. Two weeks ago, only a couple of days after the ghastly news and images originating from Palmyra, I visited Munich to celebrate my father's 77th birthday. It happened to be one of the days when the refugee trains arrived from Hungary, a continent that was ravaged by two world wars, but finally has found a way towards a peaceful society now overflows with desperate families fleeing unspeakable atrocities made even more unbearable by the magnification on modern social media. For families that had fled destruction and devastation, that train station, the welcoming crowds paired with unfailing German efficiency, offered safety and the hope of a brighter future. But despite these visions of hope, it is not good intentions alone that will bring peace to a world laid to waste by violence. European governments now crawl again over how to deal with the influx of refugees and migrants. And even if a good solution can be found to the refugee crisis, it only deals with the symptoms of the crisis, not its cause, the spread of new forms of violent conflict. For too long, Conventional methods have been applied to unconventional problems with little impact. Much policymaking continues to be based on intuition, prior experience, and ideology. We must move beyond old ways of thinking to confront the new challenges of global conflicts. Traditional security, diplomacy, and military considerations must be coupled with social and economic policies based on rigorous analysis. These dimensions interact in complex ways to make this new era of conflicts, especially non-state and sub-state conflicts, difficult to understand, anticipate, and resolve. Fortunately, we have begun to see the emergence of a new generation of scholars who are using the toolkit of modern social science, mathematical modeling, 
data-driven analysis, and randomized field experiments, to name a few, to make important and sometimes counterintuitive discoveries about the underlying causes of conflict. Consider the possibilities now open to us through the Pearson Institute. What if we really understood what motivated terrorists? Our own Ethan Buena de Mesquita has asked this question and found that, contrary to popular belief, terrorists are neither poor nor ill-educated. Rather, terrorist organizations, like any organization, carefully assign highly educated operatives to more difficult missions. So education programs, well-intended as they may be, can be counterproductive, merely increasing the supply of highly skilled operatives if they are not coupled with investment in new job and economic opportunities. These and other insights are examples of a new paradigm of how to think about global conflicts, a paradigm not based on wishful thinking, ideology, or conventional solutions, but the fearless pursuit of rigorous inquiry based on the best science of our day. It is not hard to see the potentials of these insights, often challenging conventional wisdom. For policymaking, but up until this moment, the barriers to accelerating this kind of research and getting it to policymakers have been too great. Together, the Pearson Institute and the Pearson Global Forum will fill this critical gap. The first of their kind, they will serve as a much needed focal point for the study and resolution of global conflicts. The Harris School was created on the belief that rigorous quantitative research is the best guide for public policy. The mission of the Pearson Institute is the perfect expression of this belief. Nothing of the Pearson Institute's scale or scope has ever been attempted. Its goal, simply put, are to transform our thinking about global conflicts, equip the next generation of policy leaders to put these insights into practice, and convene the world's leading policymakers and scholars to find innovative and effective solutions to resolving violent conflicts. There is no limit to what we can do if we embrace the power of data-driven research to break through the tough questions that have stood in the way of progress. Thanks to the generosity and vision of the Pearson family, we are in a position to change the world. That task begins today. Thank you. And now, I would like to introduce Richard Haas, President of the Council on Foreign Relations. Dr. Haas is in his 13th year as head of the Council. Among his numerous accomplishments, Dr. Haas served as chair of the multi-party negotiations in Northern Ireland, for which he received the 2013 Tipperary International Peace Award. From January 2001 to June 2003, Dr. Haas was director of policy planning for the US Department of State where he was a principal advisor to Secretary of State Colin Powell. Confirmed by the US Senate to hold the rank of ambassador, Dr. Haas has also served as US coordinator for foreign policy towards the future of Afghanistan. In recognition of his service, he received the State Department Distinguished Honor Award. Please join me in welcoming Richard Haas. Well, good morning. And I want to begin first and foremost by, by congratulating Tom and Tim Pearson and the entire Pearson family. And while I'm in the generosity mood, I also want to congratulate the University of Chicago and its president, uh, Bob Zimmer, on this extraordinarily important undertaking. One that, as you've heard and seen, will create both the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts, but also the, Glo the Pearson Global Forum here at the uh, Harris School. And let me just say something at the outset that I, I applaud and I marvel at the scale and the design of the undertaking. Because as you've heard, it does have multiple dimensions. It includes research, 
It includes convening power, and it includes and embraces education. And from my experience, a lot of what we call history results from the intersection of people and ideas. And this new institute and this new form embrace both. Now, truth be told, I feel a little bit awkward standing up here today. The institute is devoted not just to studying, but to resolving conflict. Alas, I've had a lot more experience with the former than the latter. In government at various times, I was the US envoy towards the Cyprus negotiations as well as the Northern Ireland negotiations. And I was heavily involved in diplomacy involving Israel and its neighbors, as well as diplomacy involving India and Pakistan. And as you, you may have noticed, I did not succeed in resolving any of these conflicts. The, there is good news in this, however, from your vantage point, is that I've left this new institute in this forum plenty of work to take on. <laughs> now, at this point, I should probably confess one additional part of my past, namely, that one of my books is titled Intervention and another Conflicts Unending. And I expect none of this was known before I was asked to speak today. But in my defense, along the way, I developed a, ripe, a theory of ripeness, that for any conflict to be settled, what is required is, is not just a formula and not just a process that the parties will sign up to, but most important, leadership that is both willing and able to make compromises. Unfortunately, what we see time and time again, though, is that such leadership is rare. That said, even when it is missing, even when you don't have leadership that's both able and willing to make difficult choices, there are tools to be employed and steps taken that can reduce the prospects of conflict and the severity of it if it were to happen all the same. There are also things that can and should be done in order to alter or ripen contexts so that leaders are more likely and able to become peacemakers. The reality, though, is that it turns out that conflicts are often better understood as situations to be managed more than problems to be solved. It's for this and other reasons that conflict has, has always been a central part of international relations and of American foreign policy. And from all appearances, dealing with conflict, from preventing it to waging it to dealing with the aftermath it, aftermath of it will continue to be a central part of the world and this country's relationship with the world. There continue, for example, to be actual and potential conflicts between states. Although there is good news here in that in today's world, conflicts between states turn out to be a more potential than actual or simply much more rare than they used to be. Also positive, and it's rarely noticed, is that largely missing from our world is either the reality or the serious possibility of great power conflict. This gets little attention. It's a bit like oxygen. It's, uh, it's central, but we don't, we don't remark upon it regularly. But think about it. The fact that great power conflict is not just absent, but highly, highly unlikely, constitutes a fundamental departure from much of history, and especially, say, from the history of the 20th century, which was marked by two ruinous world wars and by a Cold War that mercifully, for the most part, stayed cold. I say this not to be complacent, as recent events in Europe involving Russia and Ukraine have shown. The use of military force to, to alter borders is still with us. Indeed, we just marked the 25th anniversary of Saddam Hussein's invasion and attempted absorption of the independent country of Kuwait. And as for the future, I would argue the most troubling possibility of what you might call classic or traditional conflict between states is the potential for clashes among the many powers of the Asia Pacific region, which is likely to be the decisive venue for much of the yet to be written history of the 21st century. 
Well, what I believe is so different about the era we are now in is that the dominant challenge to order comes less from the classic or traditional wars between and among states than it will come from violence and conflict within weak and failing or failed states. The Middle East is obviously the principal example. And what we are seeing there today, and if I am right, and I hope I'm not, and the good news is I'm often wrong, but if, if I am right and we are in the early stages of what might be a latter day 30 years war, what we are seeing are multiple challenges to state authority and indeed to the fundamental notion of sovereignty itself. And these challenges are coming from non-state actors and various subnational groups. And outsiders, hardly limited to this country, have made the situations in many cases worse, both by what they have done and what they have chosen not to do. And to, to paraphrase something that Tom Pearson said, waiting may or may not be an option. It may or may not be the right uh, policy under any circumstances. But I would simply say, and I make this point in particular to students, whenever you think about what the choice, choices are, not acting is just as consequential in any, in any situation as acting. And the option of not acting ought to be analyzed and assessed with every ounce as much vigor as all the options of actually doing things. But whatever the cause or causes of uh, conflict in the Middle East or elsewhere, what we are seeing now is the results. And as you've heard up here before, there are, the results are horrific in many cases in terms of lives lost, people displaced, and so societies and economies disrupted. Uh, and this is not limited, by the way, to the Middle East. Uh, such problems are to be found, say, in, in Africa and in South Asia. And it's also important here to consider, to consider potential new sources of conflict. And let me just mention two. One is the consequences of climate change, which could create conditions where you then have movements of people or deterioration of economies, which could sow the seeds of conflict. And something I've been thinking a lot about and we're working on a lot at the Council on Foreign Relations, which is the new domain of cyberspace, where the rules for what is to be allowed and what is to be banned have yet to be, have yet to be written. And let me just say, the challenge here is arguably of comparable importance. The challenge here in the realm of cyberspace. It's of comparable importance, I would argue, to what was the case after the emergence of nuclear weapons after the Second World War. And at that time, you had the response of deterrence theory and arms control. I would actually argue that we need something no less creative and no less ambitious now for how to deal with this new realm uh, of cyberspace. The Pearson Institute thus, in all these areas, has not just an opportunity, but let me say an obligation to make a difference, to provide a venue where the best and brightest can meet, a home where scholars and practitioners can, can come together to draw lessons, lessons from what has been tried in the field and to produce policy relevant findings and policy relevant recommendations. And these, these findings and recommendations should deal with how best to use all the tools that are available for preventing conflict, to how to use all the tools available for bringing existing conflicts to an end and then how to use all the tools that are available for rebuilding and stabilize societies that are coming out of conflicts. This should also be an institution where a new generation of men and women who understand issues of conflict and who are committed to doing something about them, where they can at one and the same time and one and the same place learn about big ideas and big data. So these are great and these are exciting tasks and they are also critical. So I want to end where I began by thanking the Pearsons and the University of Chicago for making the commitment to take on these issues and taking on these missions. Let me just say everyone in this room and everyone also not in this room has a stake in their collective success. Thank you very much.
If you're in any way engaged in the world, you can't help but clearly understand the nature and the proclivity for global conflict in today's world. There's no more pressing issue in our judgment than the study and potential resolution or reduction of global conflicts. In large part, it's become our mission. Understanding the problem and doing something about it are two different things. It's the doing something about it that is consistent with the Pearsons. That family thinks big. They may have come from a small town in the Midwest, but there is something within them that thinks on a very broad scale. When you give a gift on the scale that the Pearson family is giving, you are connecting with your real values. Our father was a uh, Methodist minister. Our mother was a uh, homemaker raising four sons, but she also found time to uh, teach at the collegiate level. It was not uncommon at all to have other theologians, missionaries, intellectuals, writers come home to dinner. And you can't help but, through that exposure, develop an interest in the world. I think what drives Tim and Tom is a desire to solve a world problem. And they have focused on global conflict. Over the last five to 10 years, Tim and I have had an opportunity to meet and interface with a number of the Nobel Peace Prize laureates. It was a result of that experience and those discussions that we came to realize that individuals can make a, a difference. The Nobel Association was a good fit for the Pearsons. They both share the lofty ambitions of making the world a better place. I think this started in the right place with Nobel as the inspiration. This relationship and partnership that they now have with the University of Chicago is absolutely perfect. When I heard from the Pearsons about this gift, I was blown away. I had no idea they were talking about a gift of this magnitude or something would have this enormous impact. This is an incredible legacy, a legacy of ideas and ideas that will generate new ideas and new solutions to issues that emerge that we can't even imagine today. On behalf of myself and my three brothers, we're very, very gratified with the first steps that are being taken toward the creation of the Pearson Institute. If we change one life, we've been successful. If we change millions of people's lives because of our ability to inform policy, we don't believe that there's any greater legacy as a Pearson family than we can leave for the world. It is now my pleasure to introduce Timothy R. Pearson. Mr. Pearson is a sought-after business advisor and philanthropist, and is founder, president, and CEO of Pearson Advisors and Partners, a marketing management consulting firm that serves Fortune 1000 clients. He is a frequent keynote speaker and lecturer, and the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Old Rules of Marketing Are Dead. Previously, Mr. Pearson served for almost a decade as vice chair, global managing partner, and Chief Marketing Officer for KPMG, the global big four accounting, tax, and consulting firm. He also was President and CEO of a leading international management consulting firm. Earlier, he was President of several advertising agencies where he led award-winning initiatives for leading global companies. Mr. Pearson is active with numerous civic and charitable organizations. And in 2012 and 2013, he and his brother were the first global benefactors of the Nobel Peace Prize concert and the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo, Norway, through the Thomas L. Pearson and the Pearson Family Members Fund. He has also served on the Nobel Peace Center's advisory board. Mr. Pearson graduated cum laude with a BA degree in English literature from DePaul University. Please join me in welcoming to stage Tim Pearson. Good morning. 
In the next few minutes, uh, I've been asked to talk about, uh, for a, a brief few minutes, about our family's journey as philanthropist. But first, I'd like to do something else. I'd like to thank each of you for being here today to help us celebrate this important undertaking between the University of Chicago, the Harris School, and the Pearson family. Your support and encouragement means everything to us. So, Let's talk about our journey. Actually, uh, our story is not all that unusual. Essentially, it's the story of Midwestern roots wrapped up in the pursuit of the American dream. In a few words, the Pearson Institute and the Pearson Global Forum is the result of the American dream. At its core, it's the consequence about dreaming about doing something really important, something really worth doing. You know, in, in all honesty, our family was like most families in the 1950s and 1960s. We grew up in the middle class, and actually probably with some reflection, the lower middle class. Uh, our father, in the early years, was a young minister barely, barely earning enough to feed and clothe his family. As Tom said, our mother uh, was the daughter of a Kansas minister and a stay-at-home wife before she returned to teaching theater and religion at the college level. Uh, she was charged with raising four boys, Tim, Tom, David, and Philip, in small Iowa towns. I'm sure you haven't heard of any of them. St. Ansgar, Little Cedar, Esterville, Spencer, and even a lake called Lake Okaboji. You know, from an early age, we were taught the things that Midwesterners are typically taught. The value of putting in a good day's work, honoring our commitment, striving to excel and to always do our best regardless of what the task or undertaking was. We were taught that the best life is to lead a meaningful life. That if you're able to do just a little bit, a little bit every day, that over time, your actions can actually overwhelm the world. Probably the the first time we truly came to understand the sense of personal sacrifice was when we were in the middle grades. As school ended that year, our parents sat us down and shared with us that our father would be gone for most of the summer. And I, I must admit, initially we did not understand why. We didn't even recognize the significance of the nondescript package and the inherent threat that was left on our doorstep one July evening with the warning, the Klan is watching you. It wasn't until uh, some years later that we came to fully appreciate that our father had spent the summer in the Deep South with voter registration and had participated in the march from Selma to Montgomery. To this day, as a constant reminder, each of the four sons keeps a framed copy of the Klan's warning in one of our father's last sermons titled, I Sat Where They Sat, proudly hanging on the walls of each of our offices. You know, so from a very early age, we were instilled with not only a sense of social justice, but an awareness of the significant and most important international issues of our time. The things that threaten contemporary civilization, things like nuclear proliferation, armed and violent conflict, energy availability, 
poverty, and hunger. As the global benefactor of the Nobel Peace Concert and the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo, we saw firsthand what individuals can do, but we were looking to make a more direct and a more significant contribution. So quite simply, our hope, our hope for the Pearson Institute and the Pearson Global Forum is this. Our ambition, our ambition is to leave the world a better place as the result of our gift. Our wish is, in the coming years, that the insights and findings of the Pearson Institute can transform the world that we live in together in some small way. The mission of the Pearson Institute, to contribute to a global society at peace, is to us truly important. But we anticipate that the journey will be daunting to find new ways to study and understand global conflicts, to significantly and meaningfully impact and inform policy, and to share these findings through the Global Pearson Forum by annually convening leading scholars and policymakers to maximize the potential for impact and preventing and resolving global conflicts. Something that has the real potential the real potential of making a significant difference in our world and advancing humankind. The Pearson family is fully committed. We're all in. We're fully committed to making a difference. In our hearts, we passionately believe that along with other like-minded individuals and philanthropists, we can, no, no, we will overwhelm the world one small action at a time. Thank you. I'm Dick Johnson with NBC5, and I can't believe, Tom and Tim, that I'm sitting here as a former classmate of yours at DePauw and friend asking this question, or a question. Uh, make, make it easy. On this, <laughs> I'm trying. On this, and of course I will. On, on, uh, a remarkable gift. As I said to the folks managing this event when they first told me about it, and as one of the speakers said today, I'm blown away. Let me ask you, though, with the daily images we see that are so hard to look at of the children and families leaving Syria, and with the news today of Russian airstrikes in Syria, and as I walked into Mandel Hall, we did not know the exact targets they had. Compared to this incredible gift and this incredible effort that is being undertaken versus the practical needs that we see day to day. How do you, and, and I must ask, how frustrating is it for you to see those daily images, know there's immediate practical needs, and yet know there's also a need for long-term study and better solutions? I'll let you. Okay. Tim's the oldest, so I always have to let him go first. <laughs> Can I still call you Dick? Uh, you know, when you're, you're trying to figure out how to do something meaningful, you face a challenge, which is, do you try to do something short-term or you try to do something long-term? The reality is this is a very, very complex issue. There are cultural fa factors, economic, military, policy, um, our belief, though, is that if you really want to change the world, if you really want to make the world a better place, you have to do those things that affect it and make, it, and make those changes for the long term. So is it frustrating to see those things short term? Absolutely. Um, but I think that you've got to go this, to the systemic issues uh, and that certainly will be the, the, the undertaking by the university uh, to deal with the problem for the long term. Uh, Dick, if I can j maybe just piggyback on Tim's comments. Um, Tim and I started our discussions along with our two brothers, uh, Phil and Dave, over four years ago. So our planning 
uh, with regards to what we wanted the Pearson Institute to be, the scope, um, the university that we wanted to, to become affiliated with and partner with. Again, that, that started four years ago, long before some of the issues that we see in the headlines um, over the last two or three months. Uh, I guess the good news is that Tim and I saw a need. We had no idea that the need was going to be as great as it is. Uh, I wish I could say that we had research available today that could be applied to um, the situations in which we find not just this country, but a number of countries around the world. Uh, it will take some time, but the fact is, I think by even starting this effort, it's the first step, maybe in a long journey, but it is the first step. So I try not to be frustrated because I know there's a number of steps ahead of us. Can I say something here? Uh, I want to back up the brothers here. Uh, $100 million is an extraordinary sum of money uh, by any accounting. Uh, but if you're talking about 8,000 people a day showing up uh, on G Germany's borders and its cities, as important as it is, it wouldn't get you that far. It's not to discourage people from contributing, but there's a sense of scale here. But if you take a step back, and you, you asked about Syria, there's very little that's happened in Syria. I would argue that's inevitable. If you look at the last nearly five years, you look at the series of decisions that have been made, what I would call acts of commission and omission alike, by local actors as well as the United States and others. We've got to learn from that. Uh, there are some very important lessons, I would think, to, uh, to be drawn uh, that might have consequences for the future of Syria, but also other places. We've got four failed states in the Middle East. We've got Libya, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. We, could, uh, we have the challenge of, the, of those four, as well as potentially other challenges in that region and beyond. Uh, we have got to begin taking stock of what we've learned, and then we've got to feed it into policy making because uh, Whatever else you may think of it, we're not doing a good job now. So I think the idea of looking, you know, again, there's, there's, there's room in life to intervene at, ma at many scales and many levels. And there's a place now for humanitarian relief. But to really take advantage of uh, an institution like this and to train a new generation of people who can uh, learn from this and, again, apply the lessons and hopefully go in and out of government or NGOs or international agencies and make something of a difference, that, uh, that could, uh, over time, actually scale up in ways that even immediate grants cannot. And our next question. Hey, my name is Mitch. I'm with the Sun-Times newspaper. And I was wondering if you could talk about the process that led you to the University of Chicago and whether or not the decision-making process uh, considered options closer to some of these conflict zones. Uh, well, again, uh, Tim and I started over four years ago, and we looked at, uh, all due respect, uh, at 10 to 12 different universities. You made the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> well, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting to that because we are here today. <laughs> um, it, uh, we looked at a number of factors, but at the end of the day, uh, in Tim and I's judgment, and I think for Phil and Dave as well, uh, it was a very easy decision. Uh, this is the perfect place for the Pearson Institute, and uh, we're looking for a very, very long-term partnership. Uh, that will hopefully have the success that we'd like. Uh, my name is Greg Borzo. I'm a freelance writer. And I wondered if you have uh, already plans about where the forum will actually take place. That's to me. So um, we're today at the day of announcement. Um, it will take, a, take some time to set up the institute, appoint the directors, appoint the faculty and also to design the forum. So at this point, we haven't decided on a location yet. The main goal for us is really to make sure that it becomes an effective convening place where academics and policymakers can come together to find effective policy solutions. Great. 
And I'm afraid that's all we have time for today from the media, but thank you, gentlemen. Thank you to the media. Um, and for the rest of you, I want to enjoy, invite you to stay for our next panel discussion. Up next, we have um, a panel discussion moderated by Professor Ethan Bueno de Mesquita from the Harris School. But first, a little housekeeping. Thank you. And uh, thank you. <laughs>